brought your attention to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and this is what the word of the Lord says there. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I encouraged you in, and I'm going to encourage you in this again here tonight, is don't let theology stop in your mind. Let theology go to your heart. For God did not just want to make his people knowledgeable, but God wanted this knowledge to transform his people's lives. If you've been a Christian for any period of time, I am sure that you have at some point along the way grown weary in your spiritual journey. And here tonight, I want to give you some really good tools. We're really going to have three guides here tonight. As Elder Zach was reading, he read about two of those, and that is Shimei and Mephibosheth. But I also want Barzillai, which he is mentioned beginning in verse 31 to the end of the chapter, to also be a guide to really help us understand our relationship with God. In this context, we're going to see three different relationships with King David. But I think there is application here in these three relationships to really help us appreciate what it is that Christ has done on our behalf. One of the points that I brought attention to last week that we're going to visit again tonight and next Thursday is that ultimately only Christ can bring spiritual peace and someday he will bring practical peace, that is governmentally as he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. We as Christians look forward to that great day. But another thing that I drew attention to is that people affect people. And one of the things I want you to know as a Christian is that your zeal for Christ, your celebration of your salvation, your excitement about what God has done in your life is contagious. And if that is true, on the other end of the spectrum, when you're frustrated and when you're down and when you're downtrodden and just really want to give up, that also can affect those that are around us. I want to encourage you in this. The Christian has a responsibility to fight for joy in Christ. I think the problem is, sometimes we just simply do not know how. Tonight, I'm hoping to give you some tools in that. Now, there are three words, and each one of these words go with one of our guides. And the three words tonight that I want you to consider are this. Fearfully, delightfully, and faithfully. I think those three words are incredibly important to you and I's mutual salvation. As we consider our salvation, fear has an incredible place in our relationship with God. As well as delight having an incredible place in our relationship with God. But faithfulness is also incredibly important in our relationship with God. And to kind of give us a flavor before we jump into the text here tonight of where I'm wanting to go, I want to read a quote from a theologian named Mark Jones. And this is what he says. Our Lord painfully shrieked with cries so that we, as his children, may sing with praise. He was parched with thirst, that you and I may drink freely from the fountain of life. He was abandoned in the darkness, that we might have fellowship with him in the light. He was crushed, that you and I would be restored. He was publicly shamed, that you and I would be publicly exalted. He was mocked by evildoers that we may be praised by angels. He gave up his spirit that our spirits would be saved. And as real as his sufferings were, our joys will be no less real. The hellish experience of the cross is the greatest testimony to the unspeakable joys of eternal life with God. I don't know how often we revisit the awesomeness of our salvation. Tonight, 
My hope is to do that with you as we let Shimei start us off on this journey. Now there are a few things that we need to do before we talk about Shimei, and that is go back to 2 Samuel 16. And so let us turn a few pages back in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 16, and let us be reminded of the former interaction between Shimei and David. So in 2 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 5, we see these words. Now keep in mind here, contextually, David has left Jerusalem because of Absalom's revolt. He is desiring that blood would not be shed, and so he is almost, what we would say, willfully bowing out. This is what it says in verse 5. When King David came to Barahim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Jerah. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said, as he cursed, get out. Get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, and you are a man of blood. Let us consider verse 13. So David and his men went on the road, while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan, and there he refreshed himself. It is clear in this text that Shimei was not a fan of King David. And in fact, I think it would be fair to say he was an enemy of King David. By the way, is our first reflection point here when it comes to salvation. I think many of us have a tendency to forget our former position before we were saved. Namely, an enemy of God. You and I have a lot in common with Shimei, even though we were not guilty of standing on the roadside as President Biden walked down the road throwing curses and, and rocks and kicking up dust on him. The reality is our offense is a far greater offense. We were enemies of God. We were against God and his ways. And like Shimei, we had no affections at all in our hearts for God. But then something happened. We were saved. I think one of the reasons why we at times can forget how glorious that is is because as time goes and life gets difficult, things start to happen, things don't go our way. Instead of having our attention focused on God, which was, by the way, why he gives us the gathering of the saints to recalibrate and refocus us, in our lives, we can forget how awesome it is that God took us from being his enemy to being sons and daughters. Now, there are a couple other quick, what I would say, statements or thoughts for us to consider here. The first thing that I want us to see is as David is going back towards Jerusalem, Shimei is there to greet him, to welcome him, even though, in what we read in the text previous, he was cursing him all his way out. But I think Shimei knew that if he did not honor David in this moment, for sure he was going to lose his life. We see here in this text that not only did he meet David, but it tells us in this text that he fell down before David in humility. And he says to him, Let not my Lord hold me guilty. Or, remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord the King left Jerusalem. So what he's doing in this moment is he is pleading for mercy and grace. Now, this is also very important. Shimei has no right to David's mercy and grace. And in fact, as Abishai so brilliantly says... What ought to happen to Shimei is he ought to lose his life. For he had cursed 
the Lord's anointed. If you remember as we went through the book of 1 Samuel, David went out of his way time and time and time again. Not only to not curse Saul, but even when he had the opportunity to take Saul's life, he would not do it because God had put Saul in position as king. In the Jewish culture, the position of king was incredibly honored, or at least he was supposed to be. And to curse the king was something that was worthy of death. And yet in this moment, we do not see David telling Abishai to take Shimei's life. But instead what we see in verse 23 is David saying these words, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. He also, in this dialogue, asked David to not take it to heart what it is that Shimei had said to him. And if we were to jump ahead, and for the sake of time tonight we will not, but if we were to jump ahead to 1 Kings chapter 2 and 1 Kings chapter 3, we would see that David really never trusted Shimei. And as he is passing the kingdom to Solomon, he basically tells him, Keep your eye on Shimei. He's not a man that can be trusted, which points to the reality that David did not find this act that Shimei was doing as sincere. But what we have also seen as we have been going through this text is that David is trying to reunite Israel again as they had been divided under Absalom. So if he is going to take someone's life who had rebelled against him, that is not going to be a good positive step towards the unification of Israel. And so we see David here as a wise leader being willing to overlook this offense, being willing to give him an oath that his life will not be taken. But again, something that we know that David does is that when David is where he needs to be, he puts his faith in God. He knows that God knows hearts. And that if Shimei is not truly repenting of his actions, then eventually he will be judged by God for those things. But even though I would argue that Shimei's repentance here is not sincere, it does remind me again of you and I's condition before we came to know Christ. Our only hope was that the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords would have grace and mercy on us. For just like Shimei, we were not worthy of this grace. And just like the accusation of Abishai, that is, Shimei is not worthy to be spared, but instead he ought to be put to death. That is you and I still living. No person comes before Christ worthy of the grace and mercy that God gives to them. And we must remember this, friend, if you're going to fight well for joy. It's very easy. Being a Christian for a while, being involved, volunteering, teaching, participating, being faithful to a church, to start to build this resolve of entitlement. That is, that I deserve the blessing. But the reality is this, we never come before God as God being our debtor. We always come before God as his servants. And this disposition is incredibly important because I will not continue to be in awe of God's grace if I get too haughty. See, Shimei was given grace and mercy, which by the way, you never deserve grace and mercy. And so have you and I in Christ been given great grace and mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy. That's the first thing I want us to consider. You know the reason you and I are saved? is because God is rich in mercy. This is really important. It's not just a little bit of mercy that it takes to save sinners like you. It's not just a little bit of grace. It is 
a richness of grace and mercy. This is the God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And it goes on later to say, by grace you have been saved. How often do you consider the greatness of God's love sparing sinners like David spared Shimei? Holding back the spear that you and I deserve? You and I deserving of death for the wages of sin is death. And yet God in His grace and mercy, according to His amazing love, has lavished this love on us. And that is the only reason you and I are saved. Oh, to rejoice in that more often. See, this breeds or creates humility and awe in our lives. Which, by the way, keeps you passionate. Do you want to be passionate for Jesus? Remind yourself regularly of His grace and mercy and love. And in doing this, watch God do this amazing work in your heart as you humbly come before Him and have an awe of Him in your life. In Hebrews 12, 28, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Did you know there's an acceptable kind of worship? And then there's a kind of worship that is unacceptable. Namely, the acceptable kind of worship is the kind of worship that flows from our hearts. Not the kind of worship that just flows from our minds. Like, well, of course God is good. Of course God is loving and graceful and kind. But my question to you here tonight is, do you feel it? Do you know it? Not in an intellectually alone kind of way, but in a heartfelt kind of way. Do you understand the significance of the death of Jesus Christ? So Shimei gets us started, but Mephibosheth takes us up on the mountaintop. Beginning in verse 24, we see Mephibosheth coming into the picture. I think it's, again, important to remind us of the context here. So let us again go back to 2 Samuel, chapter 16. Ziba, who was one of Saul's servants, was given the task to take care of Mephibosheth, because as he mentioned here, and it's mentioned also in 2 Samuel, chapter 9, he was laying in his feet, or unable to take care of himself. And in 2 Samuel, chapter 16... Ziba meets David and his men as they have left Jerusalem. Not with curses, but instead with so-called blessings. So in the second part of verse 1, it says, Then Ziba the servant of Mephibosheth met him, that is David, with a couple of donkeys saddled bearing 200 loaves of bread, a hundred bunches of raisins, a hundred of summer fruits, and a skin of wine. The king said to Ziba, why have you brought these? And Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, Where is your master's son, or where is Mephibosheth? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem. For he said, Today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord, the king. Well, Ziba lied. And in lying and bringing this gift to King David, David gave the land that was Mephibosheth's to Ziba because David was under the thought that Mephibosheth was now with Absalom and had abandoned his loyalty to David. So that's where we pick up at verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes, from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. Mephibosheth loved David. And yet, 
Ziba said that was no longer the case. If we would go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, we would see that David had made a promise to Jonathan that he would take care of his lineage. So David asked, is there anyone left of the household of Jonathan? And one of his sons, Mephibosheth, was left. And David brought Mephibosheth to Jerusalem and not only blessed him, but made him as a son of David. He actually ate at David's table with his family. And Mephibosheth asked appropriately, why in the world would you bless like that a dog like me? It's interesting. One of the big reasons we lose our delight is because that isn't our perspective when it comes to the blessings of God. God, why would you bless a dog like me like you have? One who is your enemy. One that was against you. One that wanted nothing to do with you, God, and yet you rescued me from this condition and not only rescued me, but made me a son or dog. What an amazing privilege. And this did something to Mephibosheth. It didn't just do something to him intellectually. He was not just simply thankful that David had given him these things. It grew a love in his heart for David. Because he didn't find himself as worthy. And he was blown away by this kind of love. And so when David left, Mephibosheth publicly made it clear not taking care of himself, that he was mourning, that he was upset, that his heart was broken, that David had left, and yet David had no idea until he saw Mephibosheth. So we see that David asked him, well, Mephibosheth, why did you not go with me? He basically said, David, I couldn't. I'm lame. It would have required the man who lied about me to help me to do this. And in verse 27 it says, He has slandered your servant to my Lord the King, but my Lord the King is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. Listen to these words from Mephibosheth. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my Lord the King. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I than to cry to the king? That I have no rights here. Even though Ziba has misrepresented me, already the goodness you have given to me, David, is much more than I could ever deserve. You want to be delightful in Christ? Hold that disposition. Hold that disposition tight. That we would recognize, I don't even deserve to be saved. If God gave me no other good gift from his hand, I can still be satisfied. So what does David do? I think in an embarrassing moment, he acts quickly and decides to split the land between Ziba and Mephibosheth. And I think most of us would be like, no, 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 no. That, that's not good. But again, keep in mind, David is trying to keep peace here. And as he proclaims to split the land, listen to Mephibosheth in verse 30. And Mephibosheth said to the king, oh, let him take it all. Since my lord, the king, has safely come let him have the land. David has returned. I again will be able to dine at the king's table as a son. See, the reality is this, friend. The greatest gift that you and I have received is access to God. Do you know that God is the great gift of salvation? He is the true prophet. 
1 Peter 3.18, in the first part of that verse, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Greater than forgiveness, greater than an eternal heaven, greater than the blessings spiritually that we receive in this life, is to just simply have access to God, to know God, and to enjoy God. See, in 1 John chapter 2, as there were outward signs of Mephibosheth's love for David, there ought to be outward signs of our love for God. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says this, But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. See, the Christian does not keep God's word to try to earn something from God. But instead, because of their love for God, it flows into obedience. It says, by this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And did this not flow out of Mephibosheth's life? The kind of love and mercy and grace he had received from King David flowed out of his life to Ziba, the one who was supposed to care for him. The one that was supposed to take care of him. The one that was supposed to have Mephibosheth's best interest in mind. But yet, he had failed in that task. And what was the response of Mephibosheth? Love, grace, mercy. Let him take it all. Since my Lord, the King, has come safely. So we've considered here tonight... Fearfully submitting to the king, delightfully following the king, and lastly, I want us to consider faithfully serving the king. I want us to turn back again one or two pages in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 17. I want us to be reminded of our last individual who will help us here tonight be reminded of our great salvation. His name is Barzillai. We hear about Barzillai in verse 27 of 2 Samuel 17. We're going to begin in the last part of verse 27 where it mentions his name. And Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogolom, brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd, for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. If there was an unpopular time to be for David, it was then. This was not the time in Israel to support David in this kind of way. And yet, Barzillai did that very thing. We see that he was a wealthy man in verse 32 of chapter 19. We see that he had provided the king with food, as we just read a moment ago. And in light of that, the king wanted to bless him tremendously. And something that he asks the king in light of those things is in the last part of verse 36. He says, why should the king repay me with such a reward. And he appeals here to his age that he is not going to be to enjoy the delights of going back with David into Jerusalem and staying with him. But the second part of verse 36 really gets to the heart of the matter. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Because from Marzillai's point of view, he was just doing what he was supposed to do, which was faithfully serve the king. I want us to look at a verse, leave this for a moment, turn to the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 17. Jesus tells a parable here, and it's called the parable of the unworthy servants. This is one of the things that came to my mind when I was studying this passage. And in Luke chapter 17, we see some amazing words, and I think they really are reflected in Barzillai's life. In Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 7, it says this, 
Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he is coming from the field, Come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward you will eat and drink. Verse 9. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. It is very tempting for us as Christians to feel like we're owed something when we serve Christ. To feel like we are worthy servants, that we are almost entitled to all of the things that David offered for Zillai here in this portion of scripture. And what we end up seeing here is that we see that in verse 37, it says this, this is part of speaking, please let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Let him go over with my Lord the king and do for him whatever seems good to you. So Barzillai in this moment says, Bless this servant instead. The blessings that you were going to give to me for being faithful to you. Bless this servant. Now, some commentators think this may have been a family member of Barzillai. We don't know. May have just simply been a servant of his. But nonetheless, he was giving the blessings that David wanted to give to him to someone else. Because he had everything he needed. He didn't need these things. He was a man of great wealth. And I think, again, there's something for us to learn here. There is nothing in the world that is greater than Christ. There is nothing I could ever be given that would be a greater reward than being given salvation. And this is important because none of us as Christians are ever needy people. We have everything we need. In Christ. In Romans chapter 12 verse 10 we see this. It says love one another with brotherly affection. And outdo one another in showing honor. Well, How can we do that? How can we kind of forget about ourselves. And be willing to outdo one another in showing honor. How can we do this? Well the reason is our hearts are full. They're full of Christ. And an overflow of that is not to consider ourselves highly, not to make much of ourselves, but instead to make much of Christ by deferring. Mm -hmm. By deferring in blessing others. See, when we really start to unpack this, we realize that as former enemies of God that are not entitled to any blessing, what we have received in Christ is the blessing of all blessings. The greatest thing that we can ever receive. And that is why being fearful and delightful and faithful ought to just simply be an overflow from the reality of what God has done in our lives. See, there's much to learn in texts like this, because even though in this text it is three individuals in their relationship with a physical king, Christ is our king. And there are attitudes and dispositions that we can take out of this text and say, God, give these to me in my heart. And so there are three applications here tonight as we wind down this text that I want us to consider in closing. And the first one is this. When we genuinely have submission and humility before God, it will show itself in submission and humility before others. Something that I talked about on Sunday over the last few weeks is our private lives matter. And if you want to make a huge impact for God's glory, then privately be humble before Him. Privately ask Him for the grace to submit to His Word, not for a show, but instead for affection. It's a weird thing, because in most of our affections in life, 
It comes a lot more easy because people are tangible. They're physical. We can touch them. Our senses are used in those relationships. But when it comes to God, we don't see Him. We can't walk up and touch Him. We're not going to hear Him with our ears. But, <coughs> if we are humble enough to say, God, give me the grace to see You in Your Word. Give me the grace to hear You from Your Word. Give me the grace to see Your power in other people's lives. You will be blown away in your pleading to your great king the grace he will give you as your affections grow for him. But we must be humble before him if we are going to be humble before others. We must have the posture of Shimei with a genuine heart, a sincere heart, falling before our king and daily asking him for grace and mercy. Second, we must be thankful for God's grace and mercy. Genuinely. Not intellectually, not theologically. I know a good definition of grace and mercy theologically. God bless you. What does it do to your heart? That's the question. In the way that we show that it's done something in our heart is when we extend it to others. Do you find it hard to give grace and mercy? Run to God. To God, let me taste again afresh your grace and mercy. All of us remember when we came to know Christ. Oh, how sweet was the taste. Do you know that's available to you still today? That taste, that delighting, that dining on that? God beckons us to come to him to be gluttons for his grace and mercy. To want as much of it as we can have. To dive into it. To say, God, I want to know your grace and mercy as much as you would allow. That my affections for you would grow and would flow into grace and mercy. <laughs> Lastly, being satisfied in Christ shows itself in being able to defer accolades in the things of this world. Mephibosheth and Barzillai teach us a lot. Mephibosheth would have rejoiced when someone got what you wanted. That's the attitude. That is when we know that God is doing a great work. That the very thing we want somebody else gets and we rejoice in sincerity. How can we do that? Because we have Christ. And He is greater than that thing. Doesn't mean that that thing is bad. But He is greater. We are okay deferring because we have everything we could ever need in Christ. See, so being satisfied is not a one time accomplishment, it's not something we attain one day and then keep it. It is a daily battle. It is a daily battle to say, God, give me the grace to be satisfied in you, to taste deeper of your delights, to be okay with others being blessed, even when I have not yet received the blessings I desire, because I know you are enough. So often when we read things like this, we think, that's a cool story. But God did not give us these things that we would simply find them to be cool stories. He gives us these things that we would actually see what the power of God does in someone's life. What agape love, or in our context, hesed love, does in someone's life. It transforms them into something new, something different, that will delight in Christ. For all eternity. Let us go to the Lord. Father, oh, how great a salvation you have given us. Father, we're cold at times, we're numb, we're unfocused, we covet, we love the world, and yet, you love your sons and daughters. Bring them back grace.
graciously, patiently to you every single time. Father, let us grow in our affections for you. Let us have the attitude of Mephibosheth. Let us be publicly known as one who loves you. Let there be the marks of the Savior on our lives. Father, thank you for all you've done in every one of these saints' lives. And let us return here on Sunday with your praises on our lips. Thank you for saving us. Praise in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. And on your way out, please don't forget to sign up for the dinner on Sunday. We need some help. That's why I let you out five minutes early because I thought, man, I'll make them really excited to sign up. But the house is also open for about five minutes on Sunday. So two minutes is all I need. Not as generous. Guys, God bless. We'll see you on Sunday.